particle systems don't really need an introduction. Sparks, snow, rain, bubbles, you name it, and all of that is possible in geometry nodes as well. Using geometry nodes is not that much more or less practical than the internal particle system. Mainly it's just a fun exercise. Here are some pros and cons in the background. Let's jump straight into it. Our particles will consist out of points. We don't have all that many options to distribute points, so let's choose distribute points on faces. A little problem that we encounter now is that all these points are locally clustered around the faces, obviously, and we have no points in the middle. I'm searching for a set position node and I can plug in a random value in the position. Now the points also cluster inside of the volume and not just on the outside faces, but we have lost our original cube. So before we start distributing the points on the faces, I'm looking for a bounding box node. This will return the minimum and the maximum point of the bounding box. Now I can plug this minimum value into min and this maximum value into max. And now we have distributed our points and also included the volume. Another cool point is, if I now scale up the original cube, the particle points follow suit and fill up the volume. For cleanliness sake, you should always consider grouping your nodes using Ctrl J and naming all the frames. Another good practice is to create little subgroups. So let's select all of that, hit Ctrl G, and we have now created a group which makes it a lot cleaner. Additionally, we can take something like the density value from inside of the cube, expose it to the outside, and have a very nice and easy way to control the density. Next up, we should move our particles a little bit. We will achieve that by using yet another set position node. If I search for a position node and plug it into the position input, nothing happens. We have told every point, look at the position you're currently at, which is this node, and go there, which is this node. And well, since they are already on the point, nothing has changed. But now I have this nice little node noodle here and I can plug in a vector math in between. And now I can influence the position using maths. I can use add in order to shift the cubes from left to right. I can use multiply to scale them up or down. And I can do all kinds of interesting stuff, but let's stay with add. Now, since we want to animate our particles, we need to continuously add a value here. Let's create a value node. And into it, we are going to type hash frame, as we've done many times before. And now if I go to frame 87, we have a value of 87. Now, if I plug it in directly, this cube is going to disappear because it has moved 70 meters to the right. So the first order of business is to make this value a little bit less extreme. I'm going to look for a utilities math node and multiply it by some low value like 0.01. And now if I play the animation, it is not moving too extreme. I'm going to join these two nodes together and call them time. And now I will get another multiply node, uh, Alt P to remove it from the frame. And this is going to be my speed value now. So if I set it to a speed of one, it has the original speed and now I can move it twice as fast by typing in two. Now the particle fun is going to be quite limited because as soon as we hit a higher value, the particles will have moved away and disappeared. That's no fun. However, there is a good vector math node that we can use now. So let's add a vector math node and set it to wrap. And whenever a position or a vector surpasses the maximum value, it will jump back down to the minimum value, essentially wrapping a vector around and around. And right now we can see nothing because both of these values have zero. If I would put in one into the max value, we would now get a continuously looping section of particles in the space between 000 and 111. And we can yet again use our bounding box, which we just have to get out of this group by plugging it into the output. Now I'm going to plug in the min into the min and the max into the max. A little crisscross here. And now we have a continuously moving particle stream inside of our cube. And if I change the scale of the cube, it still works fine just as before. Now I can just duplicate this multiply node Control shift D with node wrangler will keep the connection and connect it up to the other two axes as well. And now we can freely move it. If we don't want it to move on an axis, we just type in zero. And if we want to move it in the other direction, we just have to put in a negative value, minus three, so our particles fall down. 
Now theoretically, we can get every direction from these three axes input. It's just not that intuitive. The up and down vector is fine for me, but if I want to move it into a specific direction, I might have to plug in something like one here and one here. And I think that's not that convenient. So we will do some very simple math to transform a single value that will go from zero to 360 degrees and transform it into two values that will basically decide the combination of values that have to go into x and y in order to make up the specific direction. For that I will search for a value for now as a placeholder. This is going to be my degrees and I'm going to plug this into a math node. So I'm going to get a math node here and set it to sine. And I'm going to get another math node and set it to cosine. I have to duplicate a math node and set it to, to radians. And now I can plug them directly into this multiply value. Sine goes in here, cosine goes in here. And now let's hit play. It moves now in the positive y direction. Now if I plug in 180, it moves into the negative y direction. And for last test, 90 and it rotated 90 degrees. The thing that we have lost now is the ability to control its speed, but that is very easily done. We just have to give ourselves a little bit of space and just duplicate yet another multiply node in here. And now we have regained a value that we can use to make it faster. Now, however, since we have combined both values together, we would skew our results a little bit if we now multiply both values by different numbers. So remember for the future that from now on you will have to put the same number into both multiply nodes here. Or the entire sine cosine thing that we just did was for nothing. Get a clean nice new node group like we did before. I've left this general time factor here outside of the group. So if we need it later we can access it a little bit easier. Let me tap into this group again and rename some of the out and inputs. And I want to create a couple other inputs in order to influence the values here. First of all, this value should obviously not be hidden inside of the node group, but should be exposed. We can now connect it and leave its name as degrees and all of that and it works fine, um, just like we want. Or another trick that we can do, which would also get rid of this two radians input, we could use an input type here that already uses radians, so we don't need to do this conversion. Rotate Euler node and I will set it to axis angle and down here is this nice rotator um, angle input and I can just connect this one and now delete the node and plug in the angle and now outside of this node group I have this nice angle input with the degree sign and everything and this one already is in radian so we can get rid of this node and we can also delete the old degrees input that I've created and I'm going to not name it angle but wind direction. Another input that I'd like is the wind speed. And the last value is going to be this z value and I will call it gravity. Uh, the little difficulty is now if I put it to a value of one, um, <laughs> the particles float upwards and obviously if I increase the gravity, the particles should go down faster. So we have to invert this value, taking another math node, plugging it into our gravity connection and setting it to subtract and subtract this gravity value from zero. And now if I put in a positive value, it should be converted into a negative value. So gravity of 17 rains down pretty quick and uh, gravity of minus 1.4 makes them float nice and elegant. Now here comes the interesting part that makes it look beautiful. We are going to make it wiggle and wave a little bit like there is some local wind vortex or similar. So yet another set position note. Relatively recently they've added these noise textures and other texture types. I'm going to go for a noise texture but you can experiment around with other textures. They look cool as well. And if I plug in the color into the position now there's some noisiness now going on. Uh, good in theory but not quite yet what we need. So let me sever this connection again and we do the same game as we did in the beginning. I'm going to look for a position node, plug it into here, just in order so we can put in some maths in between here. For example, take a vector math here and set it to add, for example, and add the color into here. I can put it to a low scale like 0 
And you can see that they already get this kind of illusion of viscosity going on. So if I go into top down view and tap into edit mode, you can see that we have offset our particles from our original cube. Uh, the explanation is quite simple. We've used an add operator. And since we are adding something and never subtracting something, um, all the points tend to shift on positive axes on X, Y, and Z, which is why we have this kind of diagonal top left <laughs> shift here. Since vectors and colors um, all consist out of three individual values, RGB or XYZ, they are actually compatible. So I can use a mix RGB node in order to mix in the noise. And I'm going to set it to linear light, which will add our noise without noticeably displacing our particles. Let's check if this still works. Wonderful, this still works. Now another welcome addition is this free factor slider that we got that we can now use to influence the noise strength. You know the deal, select them all, control G, tap out, rename it. And what do we want to make available outside of the node group? First of all, the factor noise strength. The noise scale is pretty important as well. And I think detail and distortion could come in handy as well. Switch this noise texture from 3D to 4D. Now we get this W value, which is like movement on the fourth dimension. You don't need to care what it means. Uh, quintessentially, it means that we get some nice wobble and weirdness if we animate this value. So I'm going to expose this one as well. And now I could connect this to the time input as well. Rename this to time and create just another output and name this one warble. And maybe even something better like warble speed and connect this output to a utilities math multiply node. So warble speed goes into the bottom input, time goes into the top input, and the output goes into our W value. And now I can change the warble speed to zero so it doesn't warble at all, or I can set it to five and make it pretty funky. Now, if we add this to our previously established wind movement, we can get some pretty intense and interesting particles already with a lot of control now.